Hi everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly episode 148, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And today we're going to be trying a slightly different format where I'm not going to be streaming this. I'm going to be doing it a lot briefer, I guess, and I'm going to be focusing mostly on a couple of major news. So let me know in the comments what do you think about this new format. And uh, let's get cracking. Uh, as usual, the first section of the week is getting started. We got just two articles here today. The first one is looping over arrays for versus for in versus for each versus for of. A very nice comparison of the typical ways to loop over arrays. The next article is the four creational design patterns in Node.js you should know. So this basically talks about stuff like singletons, factories, builders, and all that kind of stuff. If you're interested, do check it out. This covers the getting started section. Now we're coming to the articles and news. We got three pretty cool articles here today, starting with analyzing the CVE 2020-16040, which is a V8 just in time compiler bug, uh, specifically the Turbofan bag that was patched quite recently in the Chrome uh, or I guess Chromium code base. And this article deep dives into the bug itself to demonstrate how exactly the bug happened, how exactly can it be abused to elevate the, or to basically, you know, evade the security of Turbofan. It is a fascinating write up. It is extremely technical, so I'm not gonna be going over it, but if you are interested, do check it out. It's really cool. There's a ton of details here. The author deep dives into just about all, each and every part of the V8 engine, as well as the Turbofan itself. It's really, really good. So do give it a read. The next article we got here today is Steam's login method is kind of interesting. Pretty cool write up on the approach the Steam has taken to the login form, which, you know, in the modern days, it doesn't really matter that much because you just get an SSL certificate, slap it on top of your login. And it doesn't really matter any longer if you send a plain text password, uh, which is SSL encrypted, obviously, or not, right? But when you have an HTTP website, sending a plain text password is kind of bad, right? Because anyone can intercept that request and then anyone can see your password. So this article deep dives into how this team handled that in pre-HTTPS era, I guess, and they still have the same um, method baked in because, well, why change it if it works? And the idea is pretty straightforward. So they request the RSA key from the specific endpoint before logging in, then encrypt the key the password that you give to it with the set given key and then send it to the server in encrypted form, meaning that uh, if even if someone in the middle intercepts it, it's gonna be a bit hard for them to actually figure out what the password was, right? Now, the interesting thing is, as someone noted in a discussion of this, is that uh, if there is no HTTPS, that means you can be the man in the middle, like not just by intercepting requests, but by actually faking the responses from the server, right? So if someone is, someone really wants your password, essentially, who he could act as a middleware between this uh, RSA key endpoint and give you the fake key, right? And then reverse the signed key to actually know your password. So I am not 100% sure how effective this protection is, but it's still a very interesting approach that they've decided to take basically to protect the passwords in um, HTTP era, I guess, right? Which was, I mean, that was quite some time ago. And uh, obviously, as I said already, in, you know, HTTPS era, it doesn't really matter that much. But it's a nice write-up and it's it goes into uh, quite a lot of technical details in here. So if you're curious, do check it out. It's a pretty good uh, and interesting read. Right, last and the biggest article we got here today is from the Smash Magazine and it is titled Should the Web Expose Hardware Capabilities? And it's a really big and really good discussion on the whole, um, I guess, Project Fugu slash bringing more APIs to the web thing that, I mean, it's been, so this, this is the discussion we've been having for quite some time to be honest right so i think every five six podcasts the same topic pops up whenever google tries to publish the new api or apple rejects yet another proposal or something and there's been a lot of talk about that right uh, so this article dives into the topic and uh, first there's a nice overview of 
what is like what exactly is happening with you know like okay Google is quite aggressively actually pushing towards the new APIs, uh, the ones in the Fugu project to ship them in Chromium, and then there's Apple who is basically raising security and privacy concerns. But I honestly am not convinced by. Um, that this is their only, you know, angle on that. And then there's Mozilla, who's also sort of closer to Apple, but not as, um, how do I put it? Not as um, against all of those API as Apple is, right? But yeah, anyway. So um, there's, yeah, there's a bunch of sort of technical details and a bunch of theories presented, such as, you know, platform adjacency theory and the sort of uh, angle on meta platforms, which pretty much what the web has became lately, right? So sort of this platform that works everywhere and you can just build for it and you know that the code will work on any other device that has web capabilities, right? So it's sort of what Java and Flash wanted to be, but then in the end we got the web, which uh, actually worked out a lot better than Java and uh, Flash and ActionScript in my opinion, but uh, there we go. So um, yeah, the gist is there's like a lot of, background knowledge here so if you're curious do have a read through it's very interesting it also looks at the whole thing from the perspective of you know your average user who doesn't know anything about platforms who doesn't know anything about cross-platform technologies java xamarin whatever he just knows that okay if i click the chrome it will open the browser and i can browse stuff right and um then there's the whole thing with the security risks, right? So this was this is like one of the major points that I think Apple and Mozilla are um, pushing against the new APIs with, right? So they are saying, hey, actually, if we allow access to new fancy APIs, they're going to be abused by the malicious actors, which is absolutely true. So like, <laughs> that's not even a question, right? The question is how do you actually prevent your browser from basically stealing your passwords, blowing up your computer or whatever, when a person who knows nothing about security uses it, right? So and this is sort of the primary problem with pretty much all the new web APIs. But then the argument here is, at least the Google side is like, hey, you know, we have exactly the same problems with native apps and so far it's not been a super big issue, right? Like, yes. We have people who install malware. We still have people who just, you know, go ahead and straight up install Trojans they get from emails. I think we will always have people like this unless we start properly educating them about what exactly is going on, how this computer works and what exactly they are doing when they're executing whatever file they get, right? Maybe at some point we'll get the web antivirus, like malware scanner or whatever. I think Chrome already basically has one, right? But it only works on the downloads. So maybe something like that, it's, it's interesting even thinking about that, you know, like getting a um, malware scanner that would work while fetching the pages and scanning the JavaScript or whatever, the WebAssembly code, trying to figure out if it's doing anything malicious. That sounds like a very uh, interesting area to work in. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked here. So yes, the Google's argument is basically, hey, native apps have been doing this for years and they have their own security issues and they are very similar to basically the browser. Um, and then there's the app store angle, right? So in my opinion, this is like the biggest um, point why Apple doesn't want to expand the web, why Apple doesn't want to improve the web kit, why Apple doesn't want to allow other browser engines on the app store, right? Because they are ter or I mean, I wouldn't say terrified, but they know that the moment they allow web apps to work as well as they do on Android, on desktop, wherever, right? People will stop using, or I guess developers will stop publishing some of the apps on app store and will just stick to the progressive app apps because that's in most cases, that's actually enough. Like there's very little cases in 2021 where you actually need a native app and when it is something you cannot do with a progressive app, right? On, again, on progressive devices such as Android or desktops or whatever that have proper browsers. Apple still cripples the progressive app apps with the web kit. There's still like a ton of API that are not implemented, ton of roadblocks and annoying things and... I think Apple does this knowing exactly what they are doing because they don't want to lose this 30% cut they get from the um, 
App Store developers and, and their control over ecosystem, right? Uh, again, uh, the desire for control, I think, comes from the same sort of perspective of, hey, we actually want our cut because you pe people are using this on our devices and you are selling them stuff, right? Which, from the business perspective, makes perfect sense, don't get me wrong, but, you know, from the user perspective, that's absolutely crappy approach. <laughs> it makes me a bit sad. But anyway, so there's the whole App Store thing going on and... Um, yeah, so discussion on what the what does it actually means to be the app who defines what the browser it is because um, Apple is literally the only platform that defines what the browser is and how it can work, right? Because they say, hey, you actually should use WebKit and WebKit JavaScript engine to run whatever the web content you want. Because any no like the Google doesn't care on Android, uh, the Microsoft doesn't care anywhere. Pretty much, just browser is a browser run whatever the hell you want, right? Apple are the only ones who sort of shackle, I guess, the web like this on their devices. It's a bit of a strong word, but you get what I mean, basically, right? And uh, yeah, it's, it's especially interesting to see a definition like this in the, you know, in the light of the whole meta platform thing, because the web is sort of becoming more and more of a platform rather than just a collection of websites or resources or whatever right so you you have like full on web apps that are capable of doing incredible things at this point but anyway continuing uh going yeah to talking about hey everything can be a browser you know as long as you render web content you are basically a browser which is kind of fair and uh there's a bunch of other criticisms about apple so it's like if you're curious do check it out and then it comes to the permission prompts and specifically looks at the um, web USB protocol, the web USB proposal uh, to see how, in re how bad it is in reality, essentially, right? But I think the web USB is sort of the worst case scenario here because, well, USB in general is a very risky protocol to work over, I guess, because as you might know, USB devices are not exactly the safest ones and there is a ton of known issues with them. I believe there is, yeah, there is a link here on the existing security issues with USB in general, and some of them are mind-blowingly scary when you think about that. But somehow we work fine, right? On the other hand, WebUSB allows for some really cool stuff like connecting directly to Arduino board from the browser or debugging an Android phone right from the browser. And yes, those are actually open source things that already work in Chrome at least, uh, and you can just, you know, use them if you have the latest Chrome with WebUSB enabled, which is really, really cool. Like some of those projects are really, really cool. Now, here's, here's the thing, right? So yes, USB is scary. Yes, it has problems. Yes, sort of, you know, we, we want to protect the users. So Mozilla basically rejected the Web USB pr uh, proposal with the following reasoning that, hey, USB is actually very, very high risk, which makes perfect sense, don't get me wrong, right? But um, then the author goes to talk about the permission prompts, right? So, and, and thinks that this is sort of the core problem or I guess core reasoning behind it is to figure out how exactly do we present the prompts to inform the users who are not knowledgeable enough about the web about what's going on which I think is a pretty um, pretty good angle on the whole thing, right? You know, if you're a developer and you you see a dialogue like this, hey, this page wants to connect to whatever USB device you have, you know exactly what's going on, right? So because you are a developer, you know what's happening, you know what USB is, you know what device you have plugged in, everything makes perfect sense to you. But imagine being a user who doesn't know anything, right? And you see this thing and you're like, what's USB? What's my, like some devices can have very weird names. Like, what is this? I don't know all those numbers or whatever, right? I know that I have my printer and that's it. And uh, the author here goes into discussion about sort of existing dialogues, such as, you know, for camera, microphone, GPS, whatever, the ones that you typically get from the Firefox, Chrome or whatever, they usually make perfect sense. Like, hey, this page wants to send you notifications, yes or no? It's very straightforward, right? But with something as generic as USB, it's actually a lot trickier because like, hey, this page actually wants to access your printer and it wants to print pages or this page wants to access your Android device and wants to send the debug commands, right? And 
with the sort of the genericness of the USB driver, you cannot really do this fine-grained access control, right? Because you're basically saying, hey, allow this thing to access this device using USB protocol, and then it can do whatever the hell it wants. And uh, there's already was, uh, turns out there already was an incident where the web USB was used uh, to steal UBK um, keys, <laughs> Is basic like it's it's just insane. This is a proposal that only works in Chrome. I mean, okay, Chrome has majority of the market. That is absolutely true. And uh, it was a testing phase where they rolled out of the experimental API, and somebody managed to steal freaking UBKs using it. This shows you how important it is to have the permission dialogues, right? So I think this was like um yeah there's 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 the whole incident is just fascinating just check it out if you're interested uh look at the mitigation efforts and this basically ended up just blocking a set of devices and set of classes of devices from web usb access at all because well you typically don't really need to do that but it's just it's a fascinating um incident and essentially very very curious that um People basically figured out that you could do that, right? But again, you know, if, if there is a way to maliciously use API, there will always be malicious actors who would do that. But yeah, so um, there is a bunch of other discussions here on to like including the better prompts, better sort of suggestion for better, I guess, smarter drivers, I would put it, that can distinguish between, you know, just printing the pages or just scanning stuff or just, I don't know, executing code on device or doing everything. So that instead of just saying, hey, I want access to this USB device, you would actually say, hey, I want access to this USB device for doing X, Y, Z, which sounds really cool from the user perspective, not too hard from the development perspective, but I really feel like whenever I hear that, I really feel um, very sorry for people who will have to re-implement all those drivers and add the capabilities for this fine-grained control. I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be, like, I don't know, would it be browser vendors or someone? Because the web USB is supposed to be the protocol, right? And they have the, they basically give the direct access to the drivers. So I guess there would have to be some sort of a special web drivers for that stuff. But anyway... This is a really cool solution, but sounds like a very, very um, uh, expensive one, right? Um, but I do like it. And I also think that basically, so one of the points the author here argues for is that we as users should be able to opt in into having the web USB if we're basically say, hey, I know what I'm doing, right? Let me just use that as a developer, as a expert user as whatever. So like basically if you are going through a bunch of screens and saying, hey, this is what I want. I know exactly what the threats are. I know that things can blow up if I'm using it wrong. Just enable this thing. I'm. This is the point that I wholeheartedly agree with because the potential of web USB is mind-blowingly cool. Like just look at the web, um, uh, uh, bleh, let me try that again. Just look at the web Android debugging or the Arduino connection. Like, this is amazing. If I don't need to install the web, like the ADB for Android when I want to sideload something and I can just go to the, uh, what's the the Android store, the open source store name, uh, go to their website, allow it to connect to my phone and just sideload everything directly from the website. Just think how much better the experience would be. It's, there's so many possibilities and I really want to see that in the web. Uh, I, again, I get I get the whole, you know, security and privacy angle. Privacy angle, obviously, this is something that people will use for fingerprinting. But again, if it works in the same way that, um, what is the current, um, what is the current things that we have that, uh, the VR devices, the devices in your network, this is the proposals they're already accepted and they allow for fingerprinting as well but the Firefox just basically blocks them by default and asks you if you wanna allow doing that. I think the same approach would prevent the privacy issues at least. And then, uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting discussion to be had. So what do you guys think? You're watching and I think you have your own thoughts. Do let me know in comments if um, more hardware access would be better for web or would it be worse? And if it would be worse or better, why do you think that is? Because I'm. I'm really interested in this discussion. So, you know, just let me know what you guys think. All right, that covers the articles and news section. Now we're coming to the tips, tricks and bit-sized awesomeness. We got three things here today, starting with the 
Nice tip on working with JSON stringify, JSON parse, and bigint. If you didn't know, bigint is not actually serializable with JSON stringify. If you try to do that, you will get a type error. But this article basically, a uh, tiny article, I guess, shows you how to serialize it into strings and then parse it back. So if you're working with big ints to check this out, it's quite handy. Next thing we got here is uh, the demo from the Chirp X um, author. And this is sort of the set of REPLs that run in WebAssembly directly in your browsers. You can literally run Python 3, Ruby or Node.js right in your browsers using WebAssembly. It does take quite a few second minutes, I guess um, in my, on my machine, it took about a minute to load. So it does load quite a bit of files. Okay, it seems like it caches some of them. So second time is a lot faster, but it is a really cool demo and uh, Chirpix is still, uh, Chirp X is still not released, but I would be very interested to see when it's basically live because it seems like a pretty damn powerful tool. So if you're interested, do check this one out. Okay. Last thing we got here is Shervin Williams in JavaScript. I never heard Shervin Williams name before that. It's actually a company that produces colors and uh, somebody <laughs> took their data set of colors that apparently contains the color name and the hex for it and created a node package that basically allows you to use those colors, well, anywhere. You can use it in CSS, you can use it in JS. It seems pretty damn handy actually. So if you are interested in um, a lot of colors with unique names, then do check this package and this write up out. The article also talks about how exactly the conversion is done if you are interested, uh, pretty neat. Okay, that's it for the tips, tricks and bit-sized awesomeness. Now we are coming to the releases section. We got, first of all, uh, January 2021 security releases for Node.js. All the currently maintained branches just got their security releases for a bunch of CVEs. So if you are using any of the versions in production, which well, you probably are, make sure to update them to the latest ones because they patch some uh, pretty severe things here. Next thing we got here is Gatsby version 230, which uh, brings a bunch of minor improvements, including, you know, faster image transformation, uh, Gatsby plugin, SAS v3. But in my opinion, the highlight here is the finally added support for remote static images. So you can now download, transform and optimize remote images with a single line. Before, if you ever tried to do that, you basically had to roll your own thing that would download them and throw them into the Gatsby folder, which was uh, mildly annoying. So uh, yeah, that's still in beta too. So, you know, keep that in mind, but uh, it's really great to see a feature like this finally land in there. Right, and the last thing we got here is Electron Fiddle version 0.19, which basically includes support for ARM devices and a GIST URL repopulation on Blur, which is uh, quite handy. So if you never tried Electron Fiddle, it's a super nice playground uh, to just, you know, try around the Electron API in a sort of sandboxy manner. It's quite cool, so do check it out. Right, that's it for releases. Now we're coming to the libs and demos. We do have quite a few cool things here as well. Some of them are not strictly JavaScript, but I just thought they were really cool and I wanted to highlight them basically. Starting with, with Urpflanze. This is a library for uh, generative creative coding for artists and programmers who either, you know, programmers who want to do art or artists who want to dive into programming. It uh, has a pretty nice API, seems very straightforward and allows you to do some very fancy art, artsy things. I, I'm not even sure how to call those. So do check it out. It's actually really, really cool. Next thing we got here is compiled uh, CSS in JS. So this is at compiled actually package from Atlassian. This is um, essentially atomic CSS in JS that is built for React first and foremost. I don't know if they have more adapters here, but Atlassian has been working with React a lot lately. So this is sort of the uh, styled CSS approach to it, right? And it, look, it looks nice. I mean, I'm not a fan of this thing in general, like the CSS and JS in general. I'm more of a um, Tailwind person, as you might know, but you know, if that sounds interesting, do check this one out. Next thing we got here is GS Prismarine. Uh, now this one is crazy. So somebody took a Minecraft Bedrock server and rebuilt it in TypeScript. So if you are um, running Minecraft and if you are using Bedrock Edition, uh, you can basically, or Java Edition, I believe it also works. 
Minecraft is for better condition. However, there might be plugins. Okay, so there may be plugins to make it work with Java Edition, but it does work with Bedrock out of the box. You can basically run a Minecraft server using Node.js and uh, it's written in TypeScript. It seems very solid, have tests, which is really cool. So if you are into gaming, if you're into Minecraft and you wanted to have your own server and wanted to tweak it, but didn't know how to do that in Java, well, check this out. It actually looks really cool. Okay, continuing, we got collections.js, a package that provides JavaScript implementations of common collections with a many useful features. Essentially, it's, you know, collections, but with a lot more extended features than you would get from the default one. So, you know, if you take map, there's like a ton of very handy utility functions here that you typically don't actually get in the normal JavaScript map. So that's basically all it does. There is a lot more collections than uh, the JavaScript has, such as LRU map, FU, uh, LFU map, uh, Dict, whatever, there's a ton of them. So if you are working with collections and wanted more powerful APIs, do check this one out. Next thing we got here is Box2D VASM. This is the WebAssembly version of Box2D physics engine that is compiled from the C version, I believe. Uh, that's basically all you have to know, right? So Box2D is the physics engine uh, and somebody, like I think there is Box2D JS, which is the rewritten JavaScript version. And now we get the full on C version that is basically just compiled to WebAssembly. I assume it is a lot faster than the JavaScript version. Would be curious to see some, um, oh yeah, there's comparison. Okay, so I haven't, I haven't found it last time. Uh, it seems like, okay, so there is, it's a bit bigger in size, uh, which, I guess is expected, but there is no performance comparisons, unfortunately. So if you find any, or if you do any, do let me know because I'm kind of curious. Anyway, it's a really cool initiative. So, you know, if you're working with physics and wanted a nice WebAssembly engine for it, do check this one out. Continuing, we got Simple CSS, a classless CSS template that allows you to make good looking websites really quickly. Just as it says, a nice and simple CSS that makes your website look a lot nicer if you use semantic markup, and that's pretty much all it does. Next thing is uptime with double P in the middle. This is probably my favorite thing of the week, not strictly JavaScript, but it's a really cool project that I just wanted to highlight. It's an uptime monitor and status page powered by GitHub Actions, Issues, and Pages very smart use of the GitHub infrastructure. Basically, uh, you create a repo, you define a bunch of uh, GitHub actions that run every X minutes and check the uptime of your websites, including response times, including uptimes and so on and so forth, and then generate the live status page, generate the whatever you want, basically open the issues and assign them to people whenever something crashes. It's a really cool idea. So if you are doing uptime monitoring and you wanted to do something that, you know, doesn't need to be real time and just can be like every five, 10 minutes or whatever, this is a really cool lo-fi, like low tech solution, I guess. And also absolutely free because well, GitHub actions are really cheap, even if you are paying for them. So there you go. Okay, next thing we got here is Tiny Swiper. JavaScript carousel powered by wonderful plugins, lightweight and extensible. Just as it says, it's a carousel, looks quite nice. So if you're curious, do check it out. Next thing we got here is DND Kit, a modern, lightweight, performant, accessible and extensible drag and drop toolkit for React. So this is a specifically React drag and drop toolkit that uh, seems pretty damn cool and also is fully accessible, which is uh, pretty damn impressive. So if you're working with drag and drop in React, do check it out. Maybe this is something that you wanted. Next thing we got here is is real or um, maybe easy real. I'm not sure how to read this exactly, but it's a uh, chain building for Webpack configs. So this is a Webpack config builder that supports middlewares. We are at the stage where the Webpack configs got so complex that you need a separate package that is a builder that also supports middleware that can help build you configs, basically. This is exactly why I don't want to touch Webpack configs myself, by the way. But it seems like a really nice project. So, you know, if you're working with Webpack a lot and if you wanted an easier way to build and reuse configs across your projects, do check it out. It seems like a pretty nice approach. Um, I haven't tried it, so I'm not sure how exactly it works out in practice, but looks quite interesting. All right, continuing, we got Deno Tag. A command line command that allows you to write deno tags in your HTML files. 
a very interesting approach that basically allows you to define um, deno tag inside of your HTML and then make deno build or run or compile or whatever functions that you define there and embed the result into the source code, which I mean, it actually looks like it might be a nice build tool. Not sure how scalable that will be, but looks like an interesting approach nonetheless. So if you are into Deno, do check it out. It might be quite nice. Okay, continuing, we got Synergy, a tiny runtime library for building web user interfaces. Uh, yet another UI library. This time around, again, small footprint uh, supports web components and no special tooling required and all the typical things that you expect from the modern UI library, I guess, are here. Um, some of the things are just feel a bit weird to me, like why would you do a function that does nothing literally? Like why would you need to provide that? But, you know, that's just me need picking essentially. It looks okay. So if you're looking for a different UI library, do check it out. Okay, next thing we got here is ESSSS. This is the elliptic uh, Shamir shared secret scheme implementation in TypeScript. If you're doing cryptography, do check it out. It seems pretty solid. Uh, if you're not doing cryptography, well, then check it out anyway. Maybe you needed something like this in one of your projects, but just didn't know about it. Right, continuing, we got Meow. This is a Kli app helper, a tiny helper that basically allows you to parse the arguments and automate a bunch of things such as doing the help, negating the arguments, outputting the version, converting flags to camel case and so on and so forth. So it's not as complex as something like Yargs, for example, but it does allow you to do a bunch of um, things with command line arguments a lot simpler than you would, you know, do it manually, basically, which is uh, quite handy. So do check it out if that sounds interesting. And the last package we got here is not loading for whatever reason. There we go. It's called NAPRS, and it's a minimal library for building precompiled Node.js add-ons in Rust, uh, which is super cool. So yeah, it's just as it says, it allows you to write Rust code and then invoke it from uh, Node.js and then handles the whole building for you which is kind of cool. Um, at this point, I honestly not 100% convinced that I guess it would be useful when you want to access some API that are not compilable into WebAssembly. But you know, since you can compile Rust into WebAssembly, majority of things like the Fibonacci example, obviously could be just compiled into WebAssembly and then you can just load it without building an actual node add-on and having the headaches of, you know, managing bindings and stuff like this, which is always like, mm. And it would also work on all the architecture. So this has limitations um, architecture wise. But yeah, it's uh, nonetheless a really cool package. So if you're into the Node.js add-ons and wanted to write some in Rust, do check it out. It seems pretty damn good. All right, that's it for the libs and demos. Now we are coming to the interesting stuff. And the only thing we got here is this announcement from OpenAI that is called Doll E, creating images from text. And uh, it's fascinating. Again, I'm very sad that OpenAI is not actually open and doesn't publish any of their stuff as, you know, the actually open machine learning models or whatever, but the results are really mind blowing. So they basically trained a neural network called Doll E uh, that creates images from text captions. And some of those examples are really mind blowing. Like some of them are not very good, but some of them are really, really cool. You can literally say, hey, I want to, pentagonal green toilet and it will generate you pentagonal green toilets. I don't know why would anyone want that, but that's the thing. Uh, if that sounds interesting, I would recommend looking through the whole article and you can, yes, you can literally play with any demos they have here. And there's obviously limited, um, limited switches here. So it's not like real time typing and texting, but yeah, it, it does show you how powerful the model are. Unless, of course, there was a human doing all of that, which, again, I doubt, of course, but <laughs> that would be hilarious. Anyway, um, that's basically it from my side. So this was BXJS Weekly episode 148. Trying out the new format, so let me, guys, know what you think. I think I did spend quite a bit of time talking about the hardware capability stuff. Maybe I should cut down on that. Uh, but yeah, this is essentially the gist. Um, I was thinking of recording this instead of doing a stream because it's going to be a lot shorter. I actually didn't think I would be speaking so much about hardware capabilities. I thought it would be under 20 minutes, but uh, yeah, apparently I like to speak. 
Uh, but let me know, guys, what do you think? Uh, is, is that the format that you would like to see? Because I know that most of you actually want to see continuation of weeklies. And uh, maybe this is what I just keep doing. Maybe, do you want me to live stream anyway? Do you want to like a short live stream and then just do a Q&A and just sit and chat for rest of an hour or something like that? Um, yeah, and that's basically it from my side. So... Thank you guys very much for watching. I'm going to be expecting your feedback in the comments or in Discord or wherever. Hope you enjoyed the stream. As usual, you can find all the links on GitHub. You can join our Discord if you want to. You can subscribe to YouTube and like this video. And you can, uh, what else? You can follow me on Twitter. You can, uh, yeah, that's, I think that covers all, all the things basically. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for watching. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week. And I see you next time. Bye.